Our last speaker for tonight is David McWilliams, who I guess needs no introduction. He uh, went to Blackrock College, of course, <laughs> and he no doubt outperformed me in economics. He's now tonight going to give us a talk about James Joyce and the economy. How these two things are related, I have absolutely no idea. However, he will give that talk right now, and we will then have an idea. David McWilliams, everyone. Lovely, lovely introduction, James. Uh, you talk about me doing economics here. I'm one of those people who liked the Leaving Cert so much, I did it twice. OK? <laughs> so there's hope for all the failures. There's hope for all of us. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, Alan asked me to talk for a little while. I didn't realize I'd be up on stage. I thought I'd be kind of leaning on a podium with the security of a podium. But no, it's great to be here. It's nice to be back in the school. Alan, I feel very old, not least because my son has finished Black Rock. I always thought at a certain stage I could come in as the parent, and at least that wouldn't be so humiliating. But now as we get on in life, I want to talk to you tonight about, yeah, it is a strange one, James Joyce and the economy. But the reason I picked that topic is that on this very night in 1909, a ship, a mailboat, sailed in to Kingston, a.k.a. Dunleary. And it was an unseasonably warm night. And on this mailboat was an unusually tall, skinny, 27-year-old man. And you'll know that what happens on the Irish Sea is when it is warm, it is rarely calm. In fact, normally when it's warm and there's a warm wind blowing, the sea can be extraordinarily choppy. And this young man, 27, slender, tall, had no sea legs. And he's puking over the side of the ship from Hollyhead all the way to Dunleary. He's willing the ship into the port and yet the, the waves are blowing him away because why? Because the wind is coming off the land. But he eventually docks. Who is he? Why is he on the mail boat? And what is he doing back in Ireland? That's the topic. We have to go back about a month prior to this James Joyce is sitting in his flat in Trieste. Trieste, the city, now on the north coast of Italy, but then was the major port of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So an unbelievably cosmopolitan entrepot of people coming and going. And Joyce is sitting there, and he's rowing with his brother. I don't have a brother, but I believe they're very complex relationships. You know, I really don't. I've noticed lots of friends of mine who I talk along with each other, like fellows who school me. And now as we get older, you realize they couldn't stand each other from the get-go. But there you go, right? So maybe there's a brother thing going on. But he's rowing with his brother Stanislaw because Stan is jealous of James. James has also been in Ireland in June. And September comes. Stan is trying to say, well, tell me what happened in Ireland. La, 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 la. James is saying, Stan is saying, did anybody ask for me? And James said, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe they did. I can't really remember, Stan, because you're such an unmemorable individual. So they're fighting, but the sister, Eva Joyce, is with them. So all the Joyces are in Trieste, bar the dad. And Eva Joyce says casually, she starts to get homesick because they're talking about Ireland, they're talking about Dublin, and she was quite a sensitive, very sensitive sort of younger sister. And she gets homesick, but she says casually that night, she goes, the one thing I like about Trieste, James, is the cinemas. Do you know there are no cinemas in Dublin? And Joyce is like, what? So there's no cinemas in Dublin. Dublin was a city of half a million people, okay? Not one city, not one cinema. Trieste is a city of, I think it was 280,000. They had eight cinemas, full all the time, because cinemas were the sort of Netflix of the time. They were the new technology. They were the place that people went. They were where everybody wanted to go. Why? Because you could see stuff that was being beamed in, literally for them, from all over the world. German cinema, French, Italian, American even. Okay? And this is, of course, be before subtitles. 
So language wasn't a barrier. These were non-talky movies. Joyce loved them too. Eva says there's no cinemas in Ireland or in Dublin. Joyce goes, oh my God, that is the greatest opportunity we have ever been presented with. And he is transfixed. And Joyce decides, that's it. We are going to take Ireland. We are going to become the entrepreneurs of the century. But we've no money. That's kind of difficult. So he says, what we need to do is we need to find a syndicate, right? Where do you find a syndicate? So it's a bit like those guys in Silicon Valley. They've got a good idea. They're really entrepreneurial, but they've no cash. So you find a syndicate. Now, Joyce was lucky because there was a syndicate of four investors who had made money in cinemas all over the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and they happened to live in Trieste. And he found them. And theatrically, he called them into a meeting which, given that he was only 27 and hadn't the arse in his trousers, was quite impressive, okay? But he was a great talker. Joyce was a great, great talker. And he put out a map of Ireland, but he put a cover over it. And he said, gentlemen, I know a country in Europe that has three major cities, and not one of them have a cinema. They were Belfast, Dublin, and Cork. No cinemas. And he said, if we act quickly, we will make a fortune. So the investors, and this is what happens to investors, is once you make money once, you think you're a genius. Okay? You see this all over. In Ireland, in the property boom, uh, fellows who made a few quid suddenly thought they were sort of Bill Gates or something, and they couldn't lose, right? Because that's always happens. It's, it's, it's like in everything in life, is the, the smell of success tends to make you unaware of the risk of failure. So you see it all the time. You know, people do something great, and then suddenly the next thing they do isn't that great at all. So anyway, these guys say, OK, let's do this. But Joyce has no money. Therefore, he can't get any equity. But he negotiates sweat equity. He says, I would like 10% of the profits and the equity. I will do all the work, and I will then get my rewards. They say, OK. So of course, the plan was that they would all set up the cinema and then flog it on, and Joyce would be paid but 10% of the actual equity value. So the man, the young man, who's on the Dunleary mailboat is James Joyce coming home. Within four weeks, he had gone from an idea in his flat to getting the investors, to getting the money. He said he's going to go to Dublin. He goes to Dublin. And on the 20th of December, 1909, the first ever cinema is opened here, called the Volta Cinema, proprietor one James Joyce on 45 Mary Street. Now, the reason I tell this story, and the reason it interests me and James to talk about the economy, is the type of person that we sometimes mislay, the type of person who is an artist, like James Joyce, and the type of person who's an entrepreneur, we, particularly when we're younger, tend to see them as polar opposite individuals. I blame Marxism for this, but that's another thing, right? That we tend to see the really good business person and the really good artist as two separate type of tribes, if you will. And I remember when I go back to my, my memories of school, is I remember in our class in school, the kind of arty lads and the sort of more businessy lads. There's a company, the fellows who did Biz Org, let's say. I don't know if that's still a subject. <laughs> Do you remember that subject? That was the most makey uppy subject ever. I still, I remember thinking to myself, I'm not doing that. Whatever I'm doing, I didn't go to this school to do Biz Org, right? But the lads who did Biz Org, right? And the fellows who were doing higher level English literature, you know, and into the arts and whatever, right? Or even the people doing art. They saw themselves as different, but they weren't. They were the same type of brain. Because the artist and the entrepreneur share one thing in common, which is that they want to live in the world of risk. They don't want a job. They don't want a wage. They don't want insurance. They certainly don't want a boss. 
What they want to do is express themselves. What they want to do is they want to change the world. What they want to do is say, I can do that better. Whether it's Ulysses or whether it's a company, whether it's a small company or whether it's just a painting, whether it's a bit of poetry, whether it's anything that is creative. The essential essence of both these type of boys and girls is the same. They are non-conformist humans. And the non-conformist, non-conventional person is the person who actually makes a difference, who actually drives the great world that spins around us, because they are the ones that innovate. They are the ones that come up with a notion, a crazy idea, a sense that what has gone before is not good enough and we will change it. And what we see is the economy that welcomes these type of individuals is the sort of economy that creates enormous amounts of wealth, enormous amounts of economic vibrancy, and enormous amounts of new products. But then you think, what is driving these people? What is driving that type of boy? I remember when I was a kid here in school, right? I, Alan will remember because he's taught me history and maths, I think it was Alan, many years ago, and, and how to take corners, which was very important on the under-14 soccer team before you uh, emigrated to the rugby fraternity, uh, and then you took me with you, uh, which was, it, so that was when we were young, when I was younger, skinny little fellas played out in the wing. There was a place for us. I think there's no place for us anymore. But I remember being in school and thinking, like everybody, everybody has a sort of a dream when you're young. Every single boy in that class of 30 kids had a dream. They had a voice. They had something to say. And yet what intrigues me is, why didn't more of us stroke them say it? I was one of those kids in this school, and I really enjoyed it, but I never spoke in public, not once, not once. I never put myself forward for anything, not once. Now, what was going on? As my wife said, you kind of made up for that as you got older, but there you go. <laughs> it's not just my wife, it's my mother, it's everybody who knows me, right? Did you ever shut up? Anyway, and this is... I want to talk to the young guys here, and your speeches have been extraordinary, and you should be incredibly proud of yourself, all of you. But what you have is you have a voice. Everybody is born with a voice, not just this mechanical, beautiful, evolutionary piece of technology called our voice box, which is kind of extraordinary, but you're born with something to say. And you have that when you're really young. And you look at kids in the playgrounds when they're really young, they allow themselves to be weird. They allow themselves to do odd things. They give themselves the permission. And then somewhere along the way, as we become teenagers, we get scared of something. So we have this voice. And this voice is what makes you creative. This is what makes you you. This is what makes you real. This is what makes you unique. But we get afraid of something. Some we don't want to step outside. Like I was when I was a kid, I didn't want to make a show. I didn't want to say something. What if they laugh at me? What if I put my hand up in class and they laugh at me when I have these bizarre ideas of economics? Poor old Ringo, Gregory O'Connor, who was my economics teacher. I remember he used to look at me and he's like, don't say it. <laughs> I'd say, okay, okay, sir, I won't say it, I won't say it. But actually, it doesn't really work like this. Okay, anyway, but... And then... We, this fear comes over us, and we lose that creativity, that urge to say something different. And the fear gets in on top of us. And that's a fear that we all have to face at a certain stage. And driving that voice, I always think, is purpose. And this is we talk about public speaking, right? When you get up to speak, you have to have purpose. Because if you don't have purpose, if you don't stand for something, the world sees through you. You can only fake it so long. And then the world thinks, nah, that person, I'm not convinced, because I don't see the purpose. Now, having purpose can be, in this society, an awful pain. 
in the backside. Right? I wish I had less purpose. Right? <laughs> Whatever I learned in here was something like, just say, no, 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 that doesn't work like that. Okay. But if you have those three things, and again, I speak to the, to the boys, right? If you have your voice and you find it, if you hear that little gremlin on your shoulder, the one who says, don't do that, everybody has that little devil. But you say, no, I'm going to face you down. I'm going to say something. Why? Because I have purpose. I have something to say. Then you begin that process of becoming the creative person. And when I look at the economy, when I see what has happened in this country over the last 30 years, I see lots of people say, oh my God, it must be the 12% tax that made us rich, or the banking system, or the property boom, or the Celtic tiger, or all this sort of thing. And all oh, that's kind of important, but it's actually secondary. What actually happened here is we gradually, since I was in school actually here, in the 1980s, we gradually, as a society, became kinder, we became gentler, and we became open and more tolerant of unconventional people. When I was younger, if you were gay, you left this country. You just left because you could not express yourself the way in which you wanted. There wasn't any room for you here. We suffocated. Right? I'm just using gay as one particular substrata of society. Anybody who was an outsider in this country was made unwelcome, and they left. But the problem is if the outsiders leave, you don't have any of those great malcontents who create things, because you end up with a society full of yes men and women, conventional people, and you lose the spark, the effervescence, the, that beautiful human urge to change because we suppress it with dogma. And dogma is the enemy of progress. Always has, always will be. But once our society became kinder and more gentle and more open to people, it said, yeah, you're fine. Whatever you do, you come and... Once you give license to individual personal self-expression, you also give license to what I would call commercial self-expression. I actually happen to believe that setting up a company is an act of defiance. It's a defiant act. It's saying, I am not going to go this way. I can do it better. And in this society, gradually, as we became more open, we became more creative. As we became more creative, we became more innovative. As we became more innovative, we actually became richer. Because innovation is the elixir of economics. It's what makes the economy tick. What makes the economy tick are people. And amongst that tribe of people, there is always going to be the unconventional person that stands up and changes and does something for themselves. But in doing something for themselves, they're doing something for others as well. Because they're doing what Schumpeter, the great economist, declared. They're involved in the relentless gale of innovation, which is the fact, the essential fact of the modern economy. And this is where Joyce comes in. Because people like Joyce were kicked out of this country. And with them went their genius. With them went their ideas. With them went all the amazing things they could have brought to the table here. But the outsider was expelled. And then Joyce, in his beautiful piece of revenge, made the central character of Ulysses not some fantastically giant, Homeric type character, a hero. He made him a Jew, an outsider, an advertising copywriter. OK, that's what he did. Leopold Bloom was an advertising copywriter. OK, he was a fellow who went around trying to sell people their own dreams. Right? But that was Joyce's revenge, because he said, in the outsider, that is where we get the genius. And in the outsider, that's how we get to see the world differently. And in the outsider, that's how we actually see ourselves.
because the outsider sees ourselves because he's not part of the gang. He's not one of the lads. He's walking alone. So James, to answer your question, what Joyce has got to do with the economy is everything. It's every single thing, right? Because the economy is nothing more than the aggregation of all the decisions. So when we talk about the economy, we think, ooh, what's the economy? It's nothing more than the aggregations of all the little decisions that we take at home all the time. You add all that up, and that's the economy. That's all it is. So it's us, this beautiful, fragile, unbelievably emotional creature called the human being. And when you look at economies, what you see is when an economy and a society opens up to the outsiders and the weirdos and the slightly off-center people, the slightly off-beam people, but the people have something to say and something to do and something to talk about, extraordinary things happen. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think we can very genuinely say, on that bombshell, it's time to end. <laughs> We'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention. And of course, our wonderful speakers for their fantastic speeches. George, Greg, Connor, Zach, Ben, Michael. And of course, David from BlackRock. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, good night. And safe home.